Let's wrap up the course with just a brief review of where we've, what we've covered and now what uh, we're going to do for the remainder of the course in terms of uh, the assessment particularly and if you've got any questions about it. So this is our, the last lecture, it's a really short one. I don't want to go back over material we've already covered or repeat what's been said uh, in the early lectures. I just want to wrap uh, together a few loose ends and then talk about, okay, we've finished the lecture series now. Let's just think about moving forward from here and the assessment items uh, and the couple of tutorials towards the end. Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to just review lectures, the earlier lectures, uh, the remaining parts of the course, summary of the final exam, and yeah, go from there. So review of lectures one to two, sorry, one to 11. Um, so that was a handout I gave in lecture one. So we have told the story of all of the major international treaties since 1945. So some of them we've considered in more detail. There's been some that have been, you know, just really tried to pull out an idea from. So remember MARPOL, uh, we didn't get bogged down in the technical details of that. It was really just understanding that, hey, this was a disaster driven treaty. It, sure, there's a treaty re related to marine pollution from ships, uh, but the fact that there was that series of um, major uh, oil spills from ships that really drove the creation of the treaty and then you could see changes like the Exxon Valdez so single really a single idea from that sort of treaty so building up a overall picture of the development of the system that we have now where it's come from what its drivers were how in many ways it overlaps you know so there are so many treaties that overlap in terms of their operation so the World Heritage Convention for instance the Great Barrier Reef is a World Heritage Area. It's also, you know, protecting the Great Barrier Reef is also part of meeting, fulfilling obligations under the Convention on Biological Diversity, as well as part of the fulfilling the obligations under the uh, UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, as well as uh, the, say, the Bonn Convention, uh, the Migratory Species Convention. So there's so many uh, things that overlap in this system. It's not, you know, it hasn't been designed, you know, as this engineered, fitted together where everything's neat and compartmentalized. Uh, it's a, it's um, cluttered. There's a lot of artifacts from, you know, where things came from, the, hist the history of the time. Uh, there's ongoing implementation of them. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges in many of them. So it's a complex um, regime. Thinking of it though in that story, I hope you find really helpful. Uh, the thing that I would hope is that, you know, in your future careers, that at least you remember the broad bits so that, you know, if you're working for government and something crops up about, you know, a topic related to say, um, the, you know, international, migratory species or wetlands, you know, you can remember, oh, the Ramsar Convention or something like that. And you can easily find the detail if you remember the broad bits. So, um, yeah, during the week we've worked through that, had the field trip uh, to um, Springbrook, as well as um, some workshops. So there was the, the workshop on research design and also on uh, good policy recommendations. And the two of those two um, workshops, the the components in those you're now going to use in your own research for the research proposal and research paper. So can I just draw out some themes? So the themes of the course from my perspective are understanding the main international environmental treaties in their historical and political context. And for some of those, like the Antarctic Treaty, you know, I really emphasised some of them don't make sense like if you read them from with you know in the present context of 2019 things like the Antarctic Treaty where you know it talks about not having any military bases there and not doing nuclear testing and you think who would who would think about doing nuclear testing in Antarctica and I made the point that well in 1959 when it was agreed 
it was a major concern that it, it would be used for nuclear testing and nuclear disposal, nuclear waste disposal. So agreeing to leave it free of military was actually a huge achievement for the world, well, a huge achievement between the USA and the U USSR. So the history and politics is vital to understanding a lot of these treaties. Second, linking scientific, legal and political knowledge within an environmental policy framework, and I've tried to do that through the course. In some of the um, treaties, we've looked at quite a bit of the science. We, uh, now I've emphasised you don't really need to understand it. You know, we're not gonna, I'm not going to examine you on it, but something like the Ozone Convention, for instance, you only really understand the response when you understand a little bit about what the problem was and also the significance of the ozone layer for life on our planet. And it's only in that context with under some understanding of the science that you can actually then understand the, the um, regulatory system that's created under the um, treaty and protocol and how that's implemented and why we have banned certain substances beyond just CFCs. You know, there's all these other chemicals um, and, yeah, so the scientific legal, uh, so we've, plenty of treaties, we've looked at the provisions and just read them in general and hopefully you feel more confident to be able to go and, you know, find a treaty and download it and you know that you would have to go and look at you know for any handbooks or anything discussing its implementation in detail you know that okay there's the original treaty but it can be changed by the parties and so it's really important for some of the big treaties like Ramsar, World Heritage uh, and the like to go and look at their handbooks and, under and understand them in that context so and that's just legal knowledge. Now, you know, if you can understand that and the principles for interpreting treaties and how that fits together and things like Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention, those basic rules, they open up a lot of opportunities for you to, to do work and be um, involved in, you know, international issues um, because you can, you know, correctly um, interpret and understand how these the treaty and um, later resolutions of the parties fit together. Uh, and also understanding, you know, that I gave you that diagram with the red dots going from negotiation through signature, ratification, uh, entry into force in the COPs. So I hope that that diagram is something that also sticks with you because that's, uh, I hope, a really useful summary for you of key terms. Uh, because if you understand that basic process, then a lot of other things make sense about, you know, people talk about, well, that country isn't bound by that treaty because they haven't ratified it, or the treaty hasn't entered into force, or, you know, there was a conference of the parties, and you understand what those things are within that context. So the basic process for creating and administering treaties is, yeah, a really useful part of um, the course, I hope, for you going forward. And then, yeah, building your confidence to find and interpret treaties. I hope that you also feel, okay, if I was, you know, working for the government in a couple of years' time and I have an issue, I, you can feel confident to go and, you know, find the treaty, look at the website, get, uh, you know, tooled up on the details of it and, you know, be able to an answer or, you know, deal with issues in an advanced um, way. Because you you know you know the big picture, and then you can drill down into the detail as you need to in the future. So those are, those are the themes from my perspective. Um, yeah, uh, that's overall the t the topics that we've covered. I talked about this in the first lecture, and I really wanted to emphasise that you know environment regulation is not anti jobs. It's actually the foundation or the root that sustains everything and we really need to change the conversation around you know you can't protect the environment and have jobs it's just such a false dichotomy so yeah I've asked questions like well what will climate policy look like in 2050 and try to emphasize hope because yeah while the current regime looks um, bleak yeah 
hope is going to be critical. So yeah, talked about positive solutions to address climate change and yeah, those are key elements from my perspective of the course. Can we spend a little bit of time just talking about where to from here, unless there's any questions on any of the lectures? Or? Absolutely right. Let's add that. So, to be effective, international um, environmental regulation has to be uh, incorporated. Is that, I keep saying something like that. Yeah, like Yeah. Like it's, that's not prosecuted internationally, and so yeah. we've got to keep people in Australia to account. Yeah, to absolutely. Allowance. Yeah, so it's got to be incorporated into national laws to then and then be enforced as well. So yes, that's a great point, um, and it has been a theme of the course. I didn't have it on my list, so thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, I. I suppose I've got. I'm annoyed. I'm. I've been annoyed when I've gone, been to international conferences in the past, and you get international lawyers or people that go to a lot of these meetings, and they talk about international law like it exists in its own right, and they almost they treat like the national laws as sort of like this thing of either no consequence or something that's beneath them or something that's you know really for the parties to work out, and they're concerned with international law. You know the sort of pure purist sort of view and I'm just I'm a lawyer that's you know just involved in the implementation at a national level and so while there's these international laws to me you need to look at the implementation on the ground which is through the national legal systems whatever they are so like in Australia we've got a federal system system of government so when I say national I'd also include in our context the state and local government laws but yeah, until you actually get them implemented on the ground, they're, they're not useless, but they that's the real level where you, you are either succeeding or not. And so yes, to be effective, international regulation has to be implemented into national legal systems. And it's often hard. And that's really also relates back to why I've given you for, for the research topic, you can see why reason from my perspective why I would set you the task that I have is because I want you to think about the implementation down in a national level that's you know on a topic that's relevant for you and really bring home that point that you know as I've said multiple times international law isn't just something that happens in New York or Geneva with you know people like Barack Obama or you know Ban Ki-moon that actually it's implemented by millions of people or billions of people around the world um, so, yeah, thanks. Any other thoughts, questions on the lectures? Anything that, um, you know, at your surprise wasn't covered? Um, so I mentioned population uh, a couple of times and said, well, there is no treaty on that. And we talked about women's education as being one of the things that can be done for that. But other than that, it's difficult to see how we address human population in any sort of way that's going to be culturally, politically and religiously acceptable? Yes? Um, on Monday when you spoke about the UN Security Council. Yes. How, how, how does that link? Like, yeah, how does it link into the UN So, yeah, good question. Uh, how does the UN Security Council link in with this? I was really wanting to unpack when we talked about the UN Charter, I really wanted to just unpack 
sort of the major bits of the international regime and I was really wanting to explain the Security Council as much as part of explaining the General Assembly and the point that I really wanted to emphasise there was there's no overarching international government that can just impose laws on a country like China or the US if they don't agree to it. And that then sets up why do we, you know, what's all the work on conventions that is just agreements between the parties. So it was sort of like breaking or, or explaining something so that you could understand why we actually have conventions. The Security Council, you can also think of, you know, I haven't, we haven't included anything about war here. I mentioned it in, you know, the context of the UN Charter, but war obviously has tr horrible environmental impacts. And, um, y y you know, if you think of the, the prohibition on war as being like, you could think of it as a really important environmental protection, uh, but it's not normally thought of in that way. I mentioned it in the context of the UN Charter, but really what I was trying to do there was give everyone, because my experience, people know vaguely about the UN, but relatively few people really have understand the different elements. And, you know, we know about the, the, the Secretary General from reading the news, but how it all fits together. So I was really just trying to help everyone so that we're on the same page with that. But it's, it's from, from my perspective, it's then setting up why conventions are so important because there is no parliament, so international parliament that can just, you know, so a vote in the General Assembly, a majority vote is non-binding. And so then explaining also the Security Council, that deals with international peace and security its resolutions are binding, but it's you know only deals with peace and security. So there's no power internationally to just impose on China or Australia, you know, requirements to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. It, sovereignty is such a core part of the international system that and and countries still jealously guard their sovereignty. So remember when we talked about things like the World Heritage Convention and we talked about, well, why have they been so popular? When you actually look at the provisions, you realise that the countries are still, by and large, they're still in control of their own territory and they get the advantage of signing up to this big treaty that has got a lot of public relations benefits, you know, and tourism benefits. So the World Heritage Convention is very, very popular but they haven't really given up that much. And particularly, and I explained it in the context of also uh, the, the Great Wall of China being an example, that China would have, you know, it's a critical, you know, it's a very important part of its own cultural history. And China would want to protect, even if there wasn't a World Heritage Convention, China would want to protect the Great Wall of China anyway. So if you're already doing something, like, and like Springbrook. Springbrook was already a national park before it became a World Heritage Area. So Australia in nominating Springbrook and other um, national parks, they were already fully protected. They were never going to be developed. So we've nominated something. But we haven't actually given up anything. It's like we get this benefit of them being a World Heritage Area and the recognition and the status for that. Similarly with... as a to complete the loop on the Great Wall of China. Well, if China was going to always protect the Great Wall of China and not develop it, you know, or build hotels and just, you know, dismantle it, if it was always going to protect it, then making it, putting up on the World Heritage List, it's just, it's about status and recognition, generates some, you know, some more tourism perhaps, but, you know, there's, you're not actually giving up that much. So, um, those sorts of side sort of discussions, I hope, sort of flesh out why a country joins up to international treaties and why they can't be forced to, but often there are, there are good reasons why they join up, you know, good self-interest reasons why they join up. So that's the context. Is that... Any other questions or...? Yep. if the if it's 
not happening at the national level? So it really varies from treaty to treaty. Often there's relatively little. Uh, you can always use, I mean, um, the options for if you've got a resolving an international dispute. So let's just think, for instance, about um, the South China Sea, where um, China is claiming this massive area that pretty clearly doesn't reflect the United Nations Conference on, um, Convention on the Law of the Sea, this huge area that's like virtually to the um, land of Malaysia and, you know, the Philippines and all of these countries that... So there's this dispute. So how can they resolve it? Um, there were options under, like, UNCLOS, allowing the Philippines to take China to court. Uh, China responded to that by ignoring it. Uh, so that's a relatively strong mechanism where both were parties, but um, the reason why China could get away with it was simply its um, might, its military and financial might. Uh, countries can go, you know, can have um, impose trade sanctions. So you see that with the US and China now with the big trade dispute and they're imposing different sanctions on each other. So um, both of them would claim that, you know, they're countervailing measures and they can, you know, that they, that there's a justification for what they're doing within the World Trade Organization system. Uh, it's pretty hard. I'm, I won't get into that. I try, I've really tried to pull back on being critical of particularly the current US administration. It might sound like that because they have criticised it a number of times, but I don't want to just... I think, you know, that administration, we just... We need to think about what it means but not get hung up on it, you know, it will change um, in the future. But um, trade sanctions is one um, option as well. Um, armed conflict uh, is a way that countries sometimes resolve disputes, even though it's in theory uh, outlawed under the UN Charter. I, I say in theory because, you know, we've got um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, an annexation of it, um, and, you know, other examples of, um, yeah, annexation of territory. So there's a range of things that, that might occur. So, you know, in terms of armed conflict, I mentioned with the dispute between China and Japan over the Senkaku Islands, that, you know, that could result... And prior to the, the South China Sea becoming this dominating issue for in the last five years, the Senkaku Islands dispute was like looked like it could really result in armed conflict between two um, major countries with you know significant um, armies. Um, so yeah, um, and that was based around claims different you know competing claims of sovereignty over islands. So there's a range of things that may happen and, and parties can also submit to arbitration or submit to the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. So we looked in relation to maritime zones um, when we're talking about UNCLOS at countries that have submitted disputes to UNCLOS about where they draw the line. Um, so those are mechanisms that can be used and then sometimes things just can't be resolved. They just sit there like the South China Sea effectively, and the Senkaku Islands, they can't be resolved at the moment, and neither country is willing to compromise, and there is no real m way that they can be forced to other th than through armed conflict. So does that... So long-winded answer to say it's complicated, um, but it's not as straightforward as to say there's no mechanisms that you can use, and it's also not correct to just say, well, there's you know, easy solutions that always work or can be forced. There's no international police force. Um, there's no, you know, the UN doesn't have its own standing armies. It can't, you know, force countries to do things that they don't want to. Okay, any other questions on... Yes? Um, Tom? So do I see the treaties becoming more strict? Uh, I'd probably answer that as, you know, flipping that question back to, you know, what will 
climate policy or international regulation look like in 2050? And the simple answer is, I don't know. Um, I think that it's really difficult to predict what will happen with climate policy at the moment because it clearly is inadequate. The current negotiations are hardly doing more than a trickle forward. They're clearly inadequate. And um, I think that it will have to change in the future, but it's very difficult to predict um, what we will do because, you know, when we're desperate, you know, a society, if we become desperate, then we will do things that, you know, previously we, you know, would ne never have contemplated. So uh, I've used the analogy in it. Uh, people have, other people have used it as well. You know, what, is the, what are the Pearl Harbor events? for climate change so is it the collapse of the arctic for instance is the arctic being ice free will that change you know the global community finally to say well we've got to take rapid action now because it looks like we will have an ice free arctic you know in coming decades um is it you know the mass coral bleaching of the great barrier reef well we've already had that twice in australia and basically blinked and you know you would have missed it in the news cycle so uh, it's hard to see what will, you know, and in the current um, bushfires, they're not being, you know, there's no real bite in the climate change component of them. The, the government really isn't feeling um, much heat to change its ways because of this huge outcry from the community. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, yes, they're going to change because they're inadequate now. How they will change? I think no one can predict. Any other questions? Okay, let's just talk um, briefly about where we go from here. So, um, from, I should have, I set it up as a period, but a lot of people have said to me, is the um, research proposal due today? But it was meant to be a period where you could submit any time in this, these seven days. So if you wanted to submit now, you could, but any time up until next Friday is fine. So um, if you need a few more days, then that's fine as well. I'm, it really isn't, I'm not stressed about this, it's about helping you. So I really just want to, I don't want uh, it to grow into something that is, um, it's meant to be a helpful first step. There's five cents, five cents, five percent uh, attached to it, but that's really just because you're going to do something and it's as good to spread out marks as, as, as much as possible. Um, back when I was an undergrad, we had whole year subjects with a hundred percent exams at the end, three hours for land law. I remember, I remember my, I couldn't write after the second hour and I do remember completing that exam with my whole shoulder because my wrist no longer worked. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, you guys got it. No. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only joking. There's good reasons why we changed from three hour um, exams 100% at the end of the year. It was extremely stressful. But now the modern approach to um, assessment is that there needs to be at least two assessment items and to try and spread out the load. And as I explained, they also the universities unfortunately have to deal with the fact that um, assignments uh, can be written by other people. So there is an important need to still maintain exams so that people have to show up and have a, and that's why there's a hurdle for the exam. So um, that's just a structural thing that really has to be built in. And with the exam, so how about I would just work through it in chronological order and come to the exam then. So um, research design presentations is just about feedback to you guys. So what I'm really looking forward, forward, I'm looking forward to them, but I'm looking for is that you've got a, a, a international framework that's clear, that you've got an idea that is doable in the time and place, time and space available. You've got about six weeks to do it. There's going to be holidays through that period. Hopefully you're going to spend time with family and friends and be doing other things. So, you know, if you budgeted, you know, a certain amount over those weeks, what can you do in that sort of time budget so that you do, you know, life goes on um, through this and I'm expecting that life will go on. So what can reasonably be expected in that time? Um, so what I'm looking for is can 
is what you're proposing, are you relatively clear on what you're doing and answer any questions you've got? For most people, I'm expecting that we'll all be fine. Yep, 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 that looks fine. And then some people will be still adrift. And what I'm wanting to do is to try and get you to commit to an idea now because I don't want you to be on the night before it's due still deciding what you would, you know, so that it builds up like this black cloud for the next six weeks. Oh, I've got to do something about that assignment. I want you to commit. So I'm trying to give you a friendly nudge to push you off and so that you can do your research steadily over the next, you know, six weeks and then it's a fun exercise that you enjoy it and you learn a lot from it. So research presentations by next Friday. If you need a bit more time, that's fine. You can just upload your template and your slides to the Blackboard site. If you want to call me and have a chat, happy to do that as well. We can Zoom if you actually want to you know, do face-to-face -face or uh, anything, happy to do that. Um, or if you're happy for me to just um, mark it online and give you feedback. And I'll do it all online so that, because I think it's great to learn from what other people are doing as well. So it's actually, I'd suggest look at what other people are doing because you learn a lot from other people. One of the things, one of the reasons why I used to love having presentations was um, everyone got to listen. And I used to make it for the internal students that you had to sit through everyone else's presentations to get a mark. But now I should have made it more f flexible so that you can just do everything online. But yeah, so there'll be, you can read other people's proposals, so you get an idea and you'll see the feedback to them. So any questions about the research design proposals? Everyone happy with them? Okay, so then there's no lectures or shoots basically until at the end. Um, the research essay is due on Friday the 10th of January. Again, if you're going to need a few extra days then I'm going to be flexible with it. Um, don't be stressed about the word limit. Uh, you know, I'm write what you want, uh, and you know we're, it's assessed against the same criteria. But I, I'm never going to take marks off for someone going over the word limit. Uh, so, um, anything else about the research essay? The topics clear. There's those two components. You've got to evaluate the effectiveness of an environmental regulatory system in the country of your choice. And the second part is make two or more policy recommendations. So how long is a piece of string, really? Um, so um, have a look at the papers that are up there, the examples. I'm not, we're not, expe I'm not expecting a PhD. You know, it's, it's something reasonable, that sort of word limit. Have a look at what's, you know, the examples that are there, you know, just aim to write a good, well-referenced, well-argued with, with good evidence um, and, you know, that would result in, you know. Cool. Uh, so, no more questions on the research essay? Okay, so that, from my perspective then, that's, you know, a, a really important, so what I'm really hoping you get from the research essay is taking what I've been saying in lectures about you know, these things have got to be implemented in to, you know, the real world through national systems. So that's what you're looking at. And then you're thinking about how can it be improved, which is a really vital thing because it's, it's easy to look at these, the implementation of any of our regulatory systems and complain about it, point to all of the errors, all of the failures, all of the things that are going wrong, whatever. It's much harder to actually come up with some solutions for the problems. So the policy recommendations are really important. So with some people, when I've been talking about your research proposals, so the basic, a basic research proposal for me is I just want to really see that you've got a clear um, framework and idea and it's doable. If it is, then I'm going to you know, say, yep, that's fine, go ahead. But the more advanced sort of question is where are you going with this and what sort of outcomes can you see it reaching because one of the things with advanced research in your careers if you if you get into sort of um, a research area is identifying questions that can lead to significant outcomes so uh, identifying what sort of policy outcomes you might uh, obtain and then 
you know, um, framing, you can frame your questions around the outcomes you, ex you know, you're already thinking you might get and then testing them as you go. So the significance of your research is, is very much dependent upon the outcomes that you reach. So the, you know, how insightful your policy recommendations are, you know, the significance and timeliness of it, those sorts of things. So that's the more advanced sort of conceptualization of identifying a really good question. But for the, the basics of, you know, going for a pass and those sorts of things, I'm really only looking for, have you got a framework? Have you got a clear idea? Or is it doable in the time and space? That's really what I'm concerned about at the research presentation stage. What, how well you ultimately do on the research essay depends effectively on the work and what, where you get to. Does that make sense? You're looking worried. No? You're okay? Uh, so does that make sense? Yeah. So have a look at the criteria and think about the criteria for the marking of the research essay in terms of the policy recommendations, the significance of the research, those sorts of things. Try and think about in framing your research around how you do that well. There's components there for communication and use of diagrams. So think about you know having some good maps and images. Um, and yeah, you must include some policy recommendations because that's like 25% of the marks. So it's you know I've seen some papers in the past where people have just haven't put in any policy recommendations and it's like uh, like that's just, just a big chunk of the marks. Um, so, cool. Um, okay, so that's the research essay. And then, then essentially the focus shifts to just preparing for the exam. And um, there's two tutorials. Um, I might just combine them in a single week or I might keep them as, it might be better just to sometimes have combined them in a single week so that if people do want to come to them, they don't have to come twice. Um, how about we play that by year and um, we might just bring them down into the first week because um, they can be fitted in. It's just, um, yeah. So those two tutorials just look at the, the exams from the last two years, so the 2017 and the 2018 courses. And so all of those are on the Blackboard site. And yeah, and there's the exam information sheets that's, that's up there. As I've said, you've got, you can take in two pages of notes. You know one of the big essays for both courses is, you know, that, um, uh, did I put it there? So just as an example, So that's the exam from last year. So um, for postgrads, so short answer. Um, on 10th of May 2018, the United Nations General Assembly resolved to establish a process called to assess possible gaps in international environmental law and inter international related instruments. Um, called the Global Pact for the Environment, explain the normal process for creating and administering international treaties such as the proposed GPE, use a diagram to assist your explanation but supplement it by explaining and writing the steps involved. So what's the diagram you're going to use? The little red dot one, isn't it? So talking about um, negotiation start, signature, ratification, entry into force COPS. So but that's just a fundamental concept. So a lot of the short answer and medium, le medium length questions relate to um, fundamental concepts. There'll be one question on uh, trade law, so that Article 20 of GATT and the, the importance of not being arbitrary and discriminatory. So last year that was the question. It was about essentially Australia's Illegal Logging Prohibition Act Anyway, we'll look, we'll look at this in the tute. Um, and then both undergrads and postgraduates have this question worth 12 marks. So out of 45 marks, you already know what 12 of them are. It's this question. 
So discuss the development of the major international environmental treaty since 1945 in the context of major historic and political events. So you've got half an hour to answer that. So you can take in two pages of notes. So one of the pages might be, you know, just those treaties and dot points. So you could have virtually that essay ready to write out. So, you know, there's probably 10 or 11 marks in the bag. You know, now if you're ready, so you already know what the question is. It's just a summary of what we've covered in lectures. And I'll come to you just in a second. Um, this question is, this aspect of it is important. What further developments can be expected in the future and why? So um, that's an, an area where you can go beyond just um, regurgitating, you know, what has been, you know, the history of it to showing insight and, uh, in, you know, meeting the marking criteria for the exam about um, the higher levels of um, understanding. So that's the essay. You already know what that will be. It's, that's exactly the wording that will be on your exam for Part C. So for undergraduates, that's your Part C. And then for post undergraduates, don't have the three essay questions. So basically, I'll um, decide on three articles uh, that um, there'll be a question like this. Mary Robson and Tara Shine argued in achieving climate justice pathways to 1.5 degrees nature climate change that and a little extract critically analyze the arguments discuss the implications and provide two or more recommendations for improving climate policies so you'll have those questions well before the exam and so you get to choose the postgrads get to choose one of three articles to essentially critically analyze and you go into the exam you can't take in the article but essentially i'm telling you ahead of time what the question will be and so for you guys, there's another 12 marks where you already know what the question is before you go in. Cool? Okay, so there's no surprises on the exam and it's, you know, hopefully, I, I hope you'll find it uh, interesting and um, also helpful in refining your thinking about, yeah, how this system works and the key parts of it. It's not just about, I, I don't make the exam about just, you know, useless details. It tests fundamental concepts and then tries to also get you to think critically. Happy with that? Okay, so that's the exam. We don't need to worry about that until the, um, you know, that, that after you finish the research essay. If you wanted to, you know, now that the lectures are fresh in your mind, you could go through and just, you know, do your essay, you know, like over the weekend. You might just type up your notes on one paragraph on each of the major treaties and that can be effectively put aside then until the end of the semester. That's what you'd be planning to write out and then you can just practice what can you write out in 30 minutes. And I think you'll find that with the number of treaties we've covered, you pretty well will only have time for about one paragraph on each and that will still take several pages to do and that will chew up half an hour. But yeah, you can go in you know, with that all well prepared. So, cool. Questions? Yeah, sorry, you had a question before. I said I'd come to you and I didn't. Uh, I was just going to say, with that essay question where we do know the, the question already, so things like the UNFCCC 992, do things like the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, they kind of come underneath that? Um, yeah. We can move yep. them under there rather than as a separate paragraph? It's completely up to you how you structure it. I think w when we come to talking about that, those essays, I always make suggestions like, you know, there's, you can have as much paper as you want in the exam, so don't yeah. scrimp it all up. Um, I really suggest using headings and um, paragraphs. Don't use dot points. Make it an essay because dot points make it hard to develop um, ideas. Uh, they tend to be quite sort of stumpy. So don't use dot points unless you're actually doing a list of things. Um, so use paragraphs, uh, have essay, sorry, have headings, and yeah. Cool? Um, I had this exam to sit earlier this year, actually. It was, um, I laughed at the time. I, I To be admitted as a barrister uh, to practice in Papua New Guinea for the court cases, uh, as an Australian lawyer, you have to th sit three exams. Um, one on PNG constitutional law, one on PNG 
land law and one on PNG customary law. And there was, you couldn't get any past exams and literally there was no material on what actually would be on the exam. So, and they basically gave us a reading list, one page for three exams that were each three hours, one page with like these books listed that w had been out of print for about the last 20 years. And then, and, then, and then it said, and relevant case law, and which is like uh, any court decision in Papua New Guinea in the last you know, 40 years, basically. That was, that was ba so there was no information on what would be on the exam, basically. There were three three-hour exams, sat over two days. So there was one day where we sat um, two three-hour exams. And like, yeah, just, I remember being, what I was most frightened about was failing, because I just thought, like, I set all these exams, like, um, you know, I would be mortified for the solicitors I was working for if I failed. Um, and just going in, having no clue, really, what was, and there was no information on what the hell would be on the exam. It was just, like, I looked on it fr from the perspective of someone who sets exams with just the zero information, and I just thought, gosh, have you tried to do that? <laughs> so I try the opposite. I try to give you guys everything other than, you know, the exam itself and say, you know, but you, you, there won't be any surprises when you, you know, once you've worked through the last couple of exams, you'll just find that, you know, the questions are modified a little bit, different set of facts, but same fundamental concepts keep cropping up. You know, you'll be asked something about, you know, <laughs> treaties, how they're created. So, cool. Um, yes. Great question. Uh, we will talk about that in the context of the exam and you know the ideas around what is you know critical analysis, um, what I'm looking for um, with that, and I often in in those um, in those tutorials I often suggest that you look at an article um, at a number of different levels. Like you can look at it whether, you know, internally, whether it's got good supporting information, whether it's internally inconsistent, incons whether, you know, the statements it makes, you know, whether they're, yeah, well supported by the, um, those, so you can look at it internally. Then you can also critically analyse it in a wider context of, say, things we've learned about in this course, and then also critically analyse it in a wider context of other things. So. I, we, we'll have a stepwise sort of approach for that, but critical analysis essentially means analysing it and you know turning around the ideas in it and um, examining them, uh, analysing them uh, from you know the perspective of a, a, a not just accepting what they say, but sa but asking you know is what does what is what they say. Does it make sense? Is it well supported? Um, should it be accepted? Or are there you know, good reasons to reject it? So in critically analyse it, you might say, I don't agree with this. It's, you know, it's actually inconsistent. What they propose is wrong. Um, but then you have to support that with reasons. So analyse it and you know, discuss it and support your, what you, your discussion with reasons. Okay. Other questions? You're, you're, you're jumping out to ask a question. You really want to. You really want to. Okay. Uh, okay, that's the exam. Talk about that more, but it won't be surprising or scary. Um, and I don't want to. I've already talked about this, so I won't dwell on it now, but you know, your, your future. I hope that this course is really useful for you uh, in your career paths, your personal vision of where you're going. This idea about a gardener, I've used it as a metaphor in earlier lectures, but uh, I think it's a really powerful one to see your career as not just making something that you'll set and it'll fix the world's problems forever. We don't achieve that, you know, that's not that's not something that we actually do. Um, what we do is more like a gardener. We take things that others have done before us and we uh, hopefully 
improve the soil for people that come after us, but we're not just going to fix things and they're fixed forever. So that's the lecture, um, le wrap up for the course. Um, love to hear from you in the future. So I've used some pictures from past students. I find it really inspiring. So, you know, if you go back to your home country and you're working, uh, you know, in a sector that's, you know, so Karen, um, this picture, um, Josiane, who you saw this picture in an earlier lecture, and you know her work with, with what she's doing. Uh, yeah, love to hear from you. Uh, so drop me an email, um, tell me what you're up to. Would love to hear about it. Yeah. So I've used this image a lot uh, in the course and the banner for the course, and yeah, I just find it so poignant and so powerful to think that you know that's the place where all of human history has occurred other than the you know dozen or so people who've been to the moon the whole of human history has occurred there and for all we know right now that's where the entire future of humanity is going to occur this beautiful planet that you know is our home and yeah sitting there in the vastness of space and yeah we need to look after it this uh, is an image. Have you guys seen this before? It's uh, this speck of dust. Um, Carl Sagan described it as this speck of dust in a moonbeam. It was taken by, was it Voyager? That spaceship that went out from uh, Earth was sent out to, you know, explore the far reaches. I think they made a Star Trek movie about it too. But, you know, it's gone. And as it was leaving our galaxy, I turned around and took a picture looking back at Earth. And that little dot in that beam on the right is Earth. And then the image is trans transmitted back. And yeah, that little dot, that's the place where all of human history has occurred. And that's where, as far as we know, all of our you know, human history, human futures will occur. We have to look after it. <laughs>